All right, uh, welcome back to the third lecture today given by Jelani Nielsen. Jelani is a computer scientist at UC Berkeley, specializing in streaming algorithms and dimension reduction. He's also an organizer of this program. Uh, he will be lecturing about uh, sketching high dimensional data. So now let's uh, turn it over to Jelani for his first lecture. All right, so as you said, I'm going to be talking about sketching high dimensional data is the title of my crash course. <clears throat> um, and also for those of you who are long term participants, um, I am actually teaching a, a graduate course this semester here um, on sketching algorithms and I'm, I'm happy to have auditors sit in the course so that's um, just contact me separately after this if you're interested that's cs 294-165 uh, um, i can send you the zoom link for that <clears throat> okay um so good so what is sketching first of all so a sketch is just compression of data, in our case, some um, high dimensional vectors, or it might be one vector, to allow for you know later querying about the data. Um, and there are a few models maybe to keep in mind. Um, so there are scenarios. So one is the following. There are a bunch of different parties that each hold some high dimensional input. So let's say here, um, each XI is some high dimensional vector. And there's some central compute node here who I'll call the referee. And each one of these parties send something to that referee who then has to send some output, has to compute some output. <clears throat> and what do they send? They send their sketches, these compressed representations of their inputs. And <clears throat> there may be some shared randomness here, some shared random string in the sky that they can all look at in helping them compute their sketches. Um, this is a model that's usually called um, simultaneous sketching. So this is this is scenario one. Um, another scenario we're going to focus on is what's called the streaming model. So here we have, you know, some this vector x. There's just one vector now. Jelani, I just the, there is a bunch of stuff that is under the bottom of our screen on mine. I don't know if other people have the same problem. Like there's an arrow that says simultaneous sketching in blue, and whatever's under there, I can't see. Oh yeah, sorry. There, there's nothing under there. Oh, okay. That's the end. Yeah. Um, so in the other scenario, there's some. Um, some high dimensional vector X is only one such vector and it starts as say the zero vector and we see a sequence of updates. So, you know, some X1, want to add some amount of some amount to X1, X1 gets X1 plus seven, X2 gets to be X2 minus five and then maybe I can update X1 again. And then someone then asks some query And then I have to output the answer to that query. And again, what I want to store is a sketch, which is a compression. Um, so I, never am I actually storing this n-dimensional vector. I'm storing some compressed representation of it. And this is called the, uh, this scenario is usually referred to as the turnstile streaming model. And the other scenario, which I'm not going to draw, is just um, 
kind of offline computation. So I have some problem that I want to solve offline on some huge dimensional data. And um, I want to, you know, maybe to speed up. It's not necessarily about um, using low memory or having small message lengths as in the, the simultaneous sketching scenario, right? In simultaneous sketching, the real goal here is minimize communication because each one of these parties is sending a message to the referee. You want these messages to be, to be short. These are the short compressions. In the turnstile streaming model, you know, you're, you're computing something on X and your goal really here is to use low memory because you could just store X explicitly in memory and, and keep all these updates exactly. But um, if, you, if you process, a, if, you, if you only ever store a sketch of X and whenever you receive updates, you update the sketch, then you have a low memory algorithm. Um, the third scenario, which I won't draw, is completely offline uh, is offline computation. You just have some high dimensional inputs and you want to compute something like find me a good clustering or solve some regression problem. Um, and the goal there is, you know, if I can if I can maybe compress to some lower dimensional representation, then the algorithms that I'm going to run later are faster. Okay. So that's the just offline computation. That's the third scenario. Um, so let me continue. Um, <clears throat> kind of, you know, a simple, a simple example, really simple example, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Not everything will start off complicated it is, uh, maybe two simple examples. I see a stream of, you know, transactions like sales on a website that sells stuff. And I want to know maybe one, you know, maybe my gross sales for the day or two, you know, just how many transactions were there? Okay, so these are these are very simple things to solve. You know, I don't need to, um, I don't need to store a full sequence of transactions, I can just store a compressed representation, which is a single number, a counter, right? So whenever there's a new transaction, I add to the gross sales and I increment the number of transactions. So I can here, you know, the simple counter for both of these. But already, you know, even here for this simple example, um, you can actually ask whether you can do better. So for example, here, um, if if it get if we, if we get up to like n transactions, naively, you would need um, log n bits for that counter, right? But if you don't want to know the number of transactions exactly, if you're satisfied with keeping track of these numbers with very small error, like I just want to make sure I know the number of transactions up to maybe one percent error, or one plus epsilon multiplicative error. Um, if I only want to know these, item two would say one plus epsilon multiplicative error. Then I do, I could hope to do better because you know let's just write down all the powers of one plus epsilon between one and n. As long as I remember which power of one plus epsilon is closest to n. Um, that's, you know, I can just return that power and I can use low memory because I only need to remember the power. How many powers are there? There are log plus one, log base one plus epsilon of n, which is approximately the same thing as one over epsilon log n powers of one plus epsilon between one and n. So if I want to remember which one is the close one, I just need log of that number in bits. All right, and that, and that is basically, uh, log one over epsilon plus log log n, right? So instead of log n bits, I'm only using log log n bits. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the best I could hope to do. And um, it turns out, and I'm not gonna, you know, <clears throat> it's gonna derail us a little bit. I'm not gonna actually go into the algorithm, but just to show you that even for these very simple problems, you can do non-trivial stuff. Um, it turns out that you can actually uh, achieve this in a streaming fashion, right? So if I just go back for a second, this is saying that if I knew ahead of time what n was, I can just remember, I can just remember the exponent of one plus epsilon that's close that that gives me the, the, the power that's closest to it.
But of course, in a streaming fashion, I don't know the future. I don't know what N is going to end up at. All I see are, you know, transactions after, you know, transaction after transaction. So basically it's increment, increment, increment N times. But in the middle of all these increments, I don't know what the final N will be. So um, when, how do I decide when to increment the power one plus epsilon? How do I decide when the exponent should change? That's not clear, it's not obvious. But it turns out there is a way to, to, to handle this. Um, and <clears throat> kind of the, the optimal bound is as follows. So for all epsilon and delta in zero one, um, you know, can compute uh, some estimate n hat such that the probability that n hat minus n is bigger than epsilon times n is at most delta. And then the, the amount of space you use is using O of log one over epsilon plus log log n plus log log one over delta bits of memory. Okay. Um, and this is optimal. To be more precise, the min of this expression and log n is optimal. Log n is the trivial, just maintain a counter. Um, so at some point, you know, um, if you want really, really, really low failure probability, then you might as well just maintain, uh, maintain a deterministic counter. But up until that point, there is an algorithm that gets you this kind of log one of sun plus log log n behavior with this additive log log one over delta, where delta is the failure probability. Um, and the, this is actually due to um, Robert Morris in 1978, as well as um, myself and watching you. That's very recent. Well, 21, I guess we submitted to something that would be in 21. So Morris basically got this without the log log whatever delta. It used to be log whatever delta. But what we could show is that, in fact, the iterated logarithm is the right answer, um, both the upper and lower bound. So already there's non-trivial stuff that you know, can happen for very simple problems. Um, so I want to move into another problem that fits into the turnstile streaming model for today. And I'm going to use that as just an example problem to um, to show you some common techniques that are used in the design of algorithms. And I also want to show you um, lower bound. So I want to prove a lower bound for you to show you that you know, sketches have to be at least a certain length to solve certain problems. Um, OK. Or rather, Jenny, there are certain sorry. problems that can't be solved in sketching. Yes, question. There is a question maybe worth clarifying, because some, uh, Daniel is asking about the model here. Is this after some t turnstile steps? Sorry, what was the question again? What's the model here? Is this after some t turnstile steps? Oh, for this theorem? Yeah. So the, the model, the model here, for this particular thing, <clears throat> um, you know, you can imagine. So here's the problem, right? So the problem is maintain a counter C subject to three operations. One, let's say init just you know, sets the counter to zero. Two, increment, increments the counter. And three is query. And this should return, let's say, an approximation uh, an approximation to the counter. Okay. So so yeah, just think of it as a as a data structural problem. The data structure has to maintain this counter C. Um, well, maybe I should have called it N, maintain the counter N, subject to initialization, increment, and query. And what I'm saying is there is an algorithm that can do this. It can give you an estimate. So N hat is basically the answer to query. It's your estimate of, of the counter, um, such that with high probability, your estimate will be close to the truth and you use you know, much less space than just using a deterministic counter. Right, but uh, John, does that answer the question? Yeah, uh, but the question is like, is is this probability bound like you know uh, the first time you query, or if can you query infinitely many times, or you you know because it's uh... it's for each query. Okay, so for each query you have, for any fixed query, you have some probability of error, and this is what it is. That's right, yes. 
Okay. Okay. Okay, good. So let's continue. And unless are there any other questions? Okay. No, yeah, okay. Very good. So <clears throat> today I'm gonna focus on um, a problem called the distinct elements problem. Okay, so here we have, again, we have this vector, so this is gonna be in the turnstile streaming model. So we have this X, which is an n-dimensional vector. It starts as the zero vector. I'm gonna imagine that, you know, update I just increments XI. Okay, and then when someone says query, we have to output the support size of the vector. Okay. In other words, we see a stream of numbers and we have to output, you know, the number of distinct numbers in the sequence. So here the answer would be, I guess, so one is distinct, so is five, seven. We've already seen five and seven and two. So here the answer would be four. Okay. Um, so these 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 numbers that I've circled, these are just the indices i that got updated, right? <clears throat> okay. So you know the there are I'd say the trivial algorithm. Is just you know maintain a bit vector of length n, where the ith bit is one. If you've ever seen item i, so this would use n bits of memory. But we want to we want to do something that's much better than that. Okay. So we're going to do in fact exponentially better. So first, I'm going to show you an idealized algorithm. And this is due to um, Flagellet and Martin in the 80s. Maybe it was 85 or 82. I don't know, I'm forgetting, but I'll just say the 1980s. And the idea is as follows. Okay, so first of all, why is it idealized? So step one, I'm going to, so let's say actually, let me actually, um, first is the initialization phase, I'll say. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a random hash function mapping the universe. Remember, this is an n-dimensional vector. In other words, all the numbers I see are integers between 1 and n in the stream. I'm going to map that universe into the continuous interval from 0 to 1. And I'm also <clears throat> going to pick, um, well, initialize this one number x to the number 1. <coughs> Okay, um, and then when I see update, so when I see that the number i in the stream, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set x to be the min of what it was before and h of i. And then query, I'm just going to return one over x minus one. Okay, so this is the idealized algorithm. Why is it idealized? A um, couple of reasons. One, you know, there, there's this there's this random function h, okay, which is a sequence of n numbers to specify h. So naively, I would have to store h in memory, and that's using n you know n numbers in memory. So 
I, I, there's already an n bit solution to this problem. So why, why would I bother with an algorithm that needs to store n real numbers? That's even worse than n bits. Um, another reason it's idealized again is because I'm storing real numbers and not bits, right? So I'm storing these h of i's, but um, h of i is a real number between zero and one. My computer has finite precision; it can't store real numbers. But you know that that can be. We'll we'll unidealize this algorithm later. I'll give a non-idealized version. But you know, if you ignore all that stuff, instead of storing n bits, I'm storing one number, right? The only thing I'm storing in my memory other than h is x. X is one number. And so um, that's some hope that you know this, this is sort of low memory, some way of thinking that this is sort of low memory. So what's going on here? So the idea is, you know, um, if <coughs> There are t distinct integers in the stream. In other words, you know the support size of this underlying vector x is t. Then x is the minimum of t iid uniform random variables. Uh, in the interval zero one, right? And what do I expect? Well, you know, here's zero, here's one. You know, basically, I expect these t random numbers to be evenly distributed on the line. So that means these gaps would be one over t plus one. This is just you know simple order statistics. So I, I expect the minimum number here to be one over t plus one, right? So I'm I'm returning. 1 over x minus 1, which you know I'm hoping is going to be 1 over kind of 1 over t plus 1 minus 1, which I'm hoping to be, you know, t. Right. So so that's where this is coming from. Hopefully that makes sense. And indeed, you can, you know, you can, <clears throat> you know. Actually, I have a question. Yes. Do you have to store the hedging function h in this case? Do you have to store h? Do you, do you, you have to, right? You do oh, have to store have. h. I mean, the reason you have to store h, so why do you have to store h? The, pro the point is, if you see 1, 5, 7, 5, whatever, you know, you have to compute h's of all these, right? And store the minimum. And the point is, when you see 5 for the second time, the random number you spit out had better be the same random number as you spit out for the previous 5. Otherwise, otherwise it's not going to be the minimum of t uh, ID random variables. It's going to be the minimum. It's going to be the minimum of you know the the length of the sequence random variables. But but when you talk about the memory cost, you didn't take into account of the cost for H, right? Right, right. That, yeah. That, so that's one of the two reasons I said it's idealized. Oh, okay. Is because I, I pretended that I could store H for free somehow. And the, the other and the other is that you know these are real numbers and my computer. I usually measure memory in bits. I can't store real numbers. Um, I think the latter is easier to solve. The latter, you basically just kind of, you know, round to some finite precision and say that it still works. But the, the business of, you know, how do you store H, that is a real issue. But in, the, in this idealized world, I'm pretending that H is free. Okay. Um, any other questions? So how would you analyze something like this? So you just do some order statistics. You would say, look, the expectation one, you prove that the expectation of x is one over t plus one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. And let me not spend too much time on it, but the point is this thing, you know, x is the minimum of I'll just call them x1 up to xt. These are these iid uniform random variables. So this is just simple order statistics, right? So the expectation of x is the integral of the probability that x is bigger than lambda d lambda, right? And kind of x can never be bigger than one because all these random variables are uniform in zero one. Um, and what's the probability that x is bigger than lambda? Um, this is. So remember, x is the minimum. So for the, for it to be bigger than lambda, it must be the case that the you know that for all i, x i is bigger than lambda, right? 
And what's that? And these are independent random variables. So what's this probability? This is, well, remember Xi is uniform from zero to one. If it's bigger than lambda, it must be in the interval from lambda to one. That's a subinterval of length one minus lambda. So this has probability one minus lambda to the T because there are T of them. So you just integrate this one minus lambda to the T from zero to one, you get exactly what I said. You get one over T plus one. And two, you could similarly uh, compute variances and say the variance of X is equal to um, the precise expression is T over T plus one squared times T plus two. But the, you know, the point, all I really care about is that it's less than one over T plus one squared, which is just, you know, the same thing as uh, the expectation of X squared, by the way. Okay. All right, good. So we have a bound on the expectation. We have a, we, well, not a bound. We've computed the expectation. We have some good bound on the variance. Um, now, how do you turn this into an algorithm? And, and this business of, you know, showing how to come up with an unbiased, I mean, why, why am I focusing on distinct elements right now? It's that there's kind of a formula for designing, not all algorithms follow the formula, many don't, but this is a formula, a recipe for designing algorithms that is often used, which is that you figure out how to come up with, you know, some random process and associated estimator such that that, is, that estimator is unbiased and it has bounded variance. And then you can turn that, and then, you know, you, the random process, what you need from it can be stored in low memory. Um, and then you can turn that into an algorithm, a low memory algorithm in the way that I'm about to describe to you right now. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so, you know, what I just described is this uh, flagellate Martin algorithm. So now let me show you an algorithm that I'll call flagellate Martin plus, <clears throat> which is as follows. Instantiate R independent copies of Flagley Martin. <clears throat> and when I see update I, um, feed this update to each copy. And then when I say query, so let's say each copy of FM gives, um, you know, stores some counter. Let me write it like this actually. So each, let's say FMI stores some counter XI. So what I'll do is I'll output um, one over, so before it was one over X minus one. Okay. So I'm not going to do one over X minus one. So my new X is going to be the average of all the X I's. So this is going to be one over R sum of X I, I goes from one to R and this minus one. Right. And the reason I'm doing this is if I just do one cop, one instantiation of the algorithm FN, then, you know, that X, Yes, it's unbiased, but it has some variance. And the variance isn't so great that it's you know, tightly concentrated. But if I run many copies and average them, then this thing is going to be more tightly concentrated around its expectation, which I said was one over t plus one. Right? And I uh, can just, uh, yes, question? Yeah, would, I mean, would the median also work here? Or would that be a bad idea? Um, would the median work in this case? Um, I could probably concoct uh, examples where if you just did what I did with the median, um, it wouldn't work. But um, certainly, if you did the median here, it wouldn't work via the argument I'm about to show you. There might you might you might be able to, you know, design some tailored argument that that would make it work. But I, I will use the median shortly, just not right at this moment. So I didn't answer your question because I don't I don't know offhand whether or not it would work for sure. Um, 
but this but this definitely does work. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so what's going on here? So let's let's you know let's, this is my let's call this x. So what do I have? I have that the expectation of x is just as what it was before t plus one, and the variance of x is now less than, you know, it used to be less than, it used to be at most one over t plus one squared. Now it's less than one over r times one over t plus one squared, just because I averaged r copies. So um, the probability now that x, and in fact, yeah, good, good, it's good, good, good. So the probability that um, x minus one over t plus one, which is its expectation is bigger than epsilon over t plus one, is at most <coughs> um, t plus one squared over epsilon squared times the variance of x. This is just Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, which is, I said, less than uh, t plus one squared over epsilon squared times one over r times one over t plus one squared. And then this cancels this. And I can make sure that uh, this thing is less than or equal to delta if I just set r here, r to be set, you know, set r to be basically one over epsilon squared delta. Sense. In fact, let me not, I want to use delta for something else later. So let me not make this delta. I'm going to make this be, uh, let's say, eta. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, so this is all part of the recipe and algorithm design, right? So I started off just having something that was an unbiased estimator with some bound on its variance. I plussed it, which meant taking a bunch of independent copies and averaging them to get the variance down um, so that I get. I get my one plus epsilon approximation with failure probability at most eta. But I paid, I paid by multiplying my memory cost by this factor of r, right? Because I'm running the algorithm r times in parallel. So whatever my old memory requirement was, it's now r times larger. Um, and r depends on epsilon and eta in this way, this one over epsilon squared times one over eta. So now I'm going to show you how to get a better dependence on eta, which is going to use the median. I'll call this fm plus plus. And what I'll do is I'll run, you know, s independent copies of this of other algorithm fm plus on the previous whiteboard, each with um, eta being equal to say a third. So with a constant eta. Okay. And you know, when I when I have an update, feed, I'll feed the update to each uh, FM plus copy. And when I have a query, now what I'll do is I'll let's say I'll you know I'll query. Uh, I'll query each, let's call it fm plus sub i, so each of the copies of the fm plus, to get some to get some estimate of t, and that estimate I'll call t i tilde. So fm plus i is giving me some estimate of t, which I'll call t i tilde, and what I'll output. Is the median over all of these of ti tilde? Okay, so here's where I'll use the median. Okay, and well, you know this is this is all kind of standard stuff uh, in in the in the design of these kinds of algorithms. And why do why do we do this? Why do we do this median of means? Um, and it's to get the it's to get better dependence on the failure probability. And ultimately, it's you know why is that happening? It's because of the turnoff bound. So the observation here is that 
as long as at least half of the FM I, or sorry, FM plus I's give a good approximation, a one plus epsilon approximation to T, to T, which I'll just call this, this is just succeeding. Right. Then the median will also succeed. It'll be a good approximation. So the expected number of copies that fail, right? Well, remember now, each one fails with probability eta. So just by linear expectation, the expected number that fail is eta times s. And eta was a third. So this is s over 3, right? So you expect at most s over 3 copies to fail. And your output will be good as long as at most half fail, right? So you know, in order for you, in order for you to fail, this number here has to deviate from its expectation by s over two minus s over three, which is s over six, right? It has to deviate from its expectation by s over six, and the probability of that happening by the turnoff bound, because these these fm pluses are independent copies, the probability of that happening is at most exponentially small in s, e to the minus some constant times s. So as long as I pick s to be some constant times log of one over delta, then um, I'm good, right? Then you know, that's, a, that's a very low probability event. The probability of that happening is at most delta. So overall, um, overall, uh, let's look over here, overall space blow up to get one plus epsilon approximation is R times S, which is O of log one over delta over epsilon squared. So whatever the memory cost of one basic estimator is, that gets multiplied by this. And then I can get a one plus epsilon approximation with probability one minus delta. Okay, so this is a, this is a very just common recipe um, in the design of these things. So any questions about this? I mean, yes, it's idealized for the reasons I said. So I wanna, I wanna talk about how to make it not idealized. And then we can talk about kind of proving some lower bounds. So questions? OK. So next, make algorithm you know, not be idealized. Now there, there is an algorithm that um, is when I make it when I make it be kind of a real algorithm and not idealized anymore. Um, I am going to actually change. I'm not just going to show you how to get this magic H. I'm actually going to change the algorithm a bit. There is an algorithm that stays somewhat close to the algorithm I just showed you, which is not idealized. But I'm going to show you a, a different algorithm um, that's not idealized. Because it also it also will show you another kind of common design tactic in you know in this in this space of, of algorithm design. Okay, so here's a non-idealized algorithm. And it's a simplification of algorithm number three in a paper by um, Bar Yosef. JRAM, Kumar, Shiva Kumar, and Trevisan in 2002. And here, here's the idea. Okay, so first of all, I know that you know everyone in this call is coming from different backgrounds. Some of us are theoretical computer scientists. Some of us you know, are in statistics or mathematics, and maybe um, we don't all have exactly the same language. So 
Um, kind of before I show the algorithm, I want to make sure that there is something that we all do know about, which is uh, something that comes from pseudo randomness. So pseudorandomness is an important concept in the design of streaming algorithms. The idea here is, you know, I have some idealized algorithm which assumes perfect randomness, but for one reason or another, I don't, you know, I don't want to assume that I have this perfect randomness. Um, in our case, the reason is that, you know, well, we have, you know, where's that perfect randomness? It's this perfect hash function H, which maps the universe into the interval from zero to one. Um, you know, I don't want to assume that I'm using that because it's very expensive memory wise to store such a function. So what I would like is not a function that's totally random like that H, but a function that is, you know, pseudo random. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it has much less entropy than a truly you know, uniformly random function H. And, you know, small enough, in fact, it, it's entropy is so small that I can store it in memory instead of n bits, I can store it in log n bits or something. Uh, even though it's mapping this universe of size n into, size, into this range, okay. But it, you know, even though it's not perfectly random, it's random enough, whatever that means, okay, we'll see what, what that could mean. It's random enough that if I were to use it in my algorithm, my algorithm would still work, okay. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be interested when, in when we talk about pseudorandomness. It's replacing these idealized, you know, perfectly random hash functions with other things that are random enough that the algorithm still works while being storable in memory using like exponentially less memory. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> we're going to talk specifically about um, KY's independent hash families. Right. So a hash family, a hash family. H is just a set of functions, you know, mapping mapping some domain to some range. Yeah. When I do this, I mean the integers one up to n into some range. And what does it mean to be KY is independent? H is KY's independent, okay, so this is, the, this is the term I care about, if um, for all x1 not equal to x2, not equal to the dot, not equal to xk in, in the domain, and for all y1 up to yk in the range, the probability that for all i, so h, the probability is now h is, is picked randomly from this family, right? So cap, capital script h is a, is a big collection. It's a set of hash functions, a set of functions. I'm picking a random function from the set of functions. And the probability is over that, that for all i, h of xi equals yi. This should be the same as if I had actually picked a totally uniformly random function from the set of all functions. And that would give you something like one over m to the k. Okay. Um, and you know there are variants on this. There's you know this concept of like almost ky's independence, um, where you, you don't care that it's exactly one over m to the k, but there's a lot to be some some, some bounded error there, etc. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that. But let me just give an example. So right, if I have h script h is you know the set of all functions mapping n into m, this is ky's independent basically for all k, right? What's the downside? The downside is to store storing a function from the set takes log base two of the set size bits, which in this case is what? It's um, n times log m. What I would like is I would like, um, <coughs> I would like a set of functions 
that's k-wise independent for some k that you know suffices for the analysis of my algorithm, which is small. I want script h to be small so that picking an element, a function from this set of functions, um, can be rep can be represented in much fewer bits than this. So the classical example. is um, you know, polynomial hashing. Which is, I imagine say n equals m equals q, which is a prime power. And then h is the set of all functions um, h of x is equal to the sum a i x to the i, where i goes from zero to k minus one, where a one up to a k minus one are all in f q. Okay. It follows from polynomial interpolation that this thing is k wise independent. Okay. It, it, it satisfies the property that of the definition that I showed you in the previous whiteboard. And here, the size of h is what basically you just have to tell, you know, to specify a little h, you just have to tell me what the coefficients are of this polynomial. So that's q to the k. So that implies that I can store h in k log q, which is, you know, basically k log n bits. So you can imagine, you know, if your algorithm only requires two wise independence, then, or you know, some constant k, then I can get away with representing my, my function, my random function using only O of the log n bits. Okay. So I know for, for many of you, you, you know, for, the, for the theory CS people in the audience, this probably looks very you know, bread and butter standard stuff, but I, I, I thought it's important to say this because for people who are in the audience who are not, you know, not in CS in other areas, this is not something that I think you think about all the time or maybe I've even seen before, um, but good. So, so th you know, this, is, this is one of the things that goes into unidealizing the algorithm um, is basically realizing that in, you, know, you don't really need a truly random function as long as your function is, comes from a two wise independent family, I can analyze my algorithm and show that it still works, um, still gives the desired you know, behavior. Oh, I've, I've created the maximum number of whiteboards. So I guess I need to start recycling. So let's go back to the beginning and let's erase this. Okay, so here's an, um, actually in fact, let me just do something. Good, so I, this is where I was. I wanted to give you one non-idealized algorithm. So let's do that. So non-idealized. So <laughs> the first observation of this algorithm is, you know, if I promised you that, um, if I promised you that the number of distinct elements is at most k for some k, then um, you know there's a very simple algorithm that uses k log n bits of memory, namely, I'll just explicitly store the first k distinct things I see, or the first at most k distinct things I see. And you know, once I see more than k distinct things, I'll just you know give up and fail. I'll just say, okay, you know what, I I, I can't do it anymore. So, so let's say there's a parameter k. If there are um, at most k distinct elements, can output the answer exactly. using basically k log n bits of memory. Just like store them explicitly. Okay. So with this observation in hand, here's, here's an algorithm. I'll pick a random function h that maps, uh, let's say, n into n and I, <laughs> from a two-wise family. And let's pretend that n is a power of two which I can do by just rounding up. Um, okay. 
So remember right now that this means I can store this H in log n bits, right? K, K log n bits, K is two, so two log n bits, so O of log n bits. And let's call this, um, let's call this data structure here. So this, this I'm gonna call a data structure. It's a very simple data structure. It's a data structure that solves the distinct elements problem in the, in the case that the answer is less than K or at most K, it'll solve it exactly. So let me call this thing uh, the simple data structure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna instantiate a bunch of these simple data structures. We'll pick K later, but we'll have data structure, you know, simple, simple one, simple two, all the way down to simple log n. So we have log n copies of this data structure. Okay. And we have this hash function h, which maps n into n. And now, <coughs> what's, well, how do I process an update when I see h, when I see, um, so if someone says update i, I'll compute h of i. So I see i in the stream, I'll compute h of i. And what is h of i? It's some number, which I'll write in binary. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll look at the index of the least significant bit. So here, it's right here. This is the, this, starting from the right, it's the first time that I have a bit which is non-zero. So these are the indices. This is index one, two, three, four, et cetera. So the least significant bit here is in index three. So sorry, I did one based indexing here. This is index three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this i, so there's a simple three that's right here. I'm gonna take this i and I'm going to send it into simple three, right? Why three? It's the same, it's this three, right? This three is the same as this three. The, the, it's the fact that the least significant bit of the hash was in the third location means I'm gonna send it to simple three. Okay, so why am I doing this? Well, how many distinct elements do I expect get mapped into simple one? T over two, right? Remember there are T distinct elements, I don't know T. T over two are gonna get mapped into simple one in expectation. T over four are gonna get mapped to simple two. T over eight are gonna get mapped to simple three, right? So in expectation, T over two to the K gets sent into simple K. Let me not, you know, spend the labor and you know and and, and write down all the math behind uh, the analysis. It's it's not very. It, ultimately, it's just chubby shoves inequality. But here's the here's kind of the idea of why this thing works. Okay. So ultimately, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set k to be you know like some constant times one over epsilon squared. Okay. Now. <laughs> How many distinct elements get mapped to the bottom? Simple, simple log n. It's t over two to the n, so t over n. So um, t over two to the log n, so t over n. Um, so unless t is large, unless t is like on the order of n, probably nothing gets mapped into simple log n, right? So if I look at simple log n, it's gonna tell me there are no distinct elements. And if I look at one level higher, it's probably also gonna tell me there are no distinct elements, right? Working my way from the bottom to the top, it's basically going to say zero, 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 zero until, until I get to, until I get to a k such that t over two to the k is you know a constant, right? Once I get to such a k, then <clears throat> um, I'm start I'm going to start to see a non-zero number of distinct elements at that level. So already that k gives me some kind of constant approximation, right, to t. Basically, I know that t is roughly within a constant equal to two to the k. Now that I know what t is up to roughly some constant factor, I, I wanna hone in and not just get a constant factor, but I want a one plus epsilon approximation. What I'll do is I'll zoom in on the level 
where I know that you know t over two to the k is some constant, but I don't know the constant. Actually, let me write it like this. I'll, I'll hone in on a level where t over two to the k I know is sandwiched between some constant c2 times one over epsilon squared and some constant c1 times one over epsilon squared. These are just, this is just k, right? So basically, let me say, I should just say k. And, but I, you know, so I know that I know that I expect t over two to the k to be between these. So I, I hone in on that level. Oh, sorry, I, I just realized I'm, I'm I, I used k in two different ways, right? Uh, this t over two to the k is approximately one. Sorry, this uh, it's better to because k is k is the parameter of the simple data structure. So let me not call this k. Let me let me call this um, l for level. So I hit, I hone in on the level L such that T over two to the L in expectation is, is theta K. So I know that it's sandwiched between C1 K and C2 K, but I don't know it up to a one plus epsilon. So what I do is I just look at that level. I look at simple L and I just see how many distinct elements were there in the level simple L, okay? And if I just scale that number back up by two to the L, first of all, you know, the, the, the number of items that land there will be the expectation plus or minus the standard deviation with constant probability. And the expectation, you know, by design, the expectation is on the order of K. So the standard deviation is on the order of root K, right? So I, I expect an additive error in the number of people who actually map there randomly under H to be on the order of root K. But, you know, if the expectation is, is roughly k, then having an additive error of root k is the same thing as having a multiplicative error of one plus epsilon by our choice of k, right? We chose k to be one over epsilon squared. So this additive error of root k is basically a multiplicative error of one plus epsilon. So if I take that number that I actually see and I scale back up by two to the L, with good probability, I'll actually have the true value of t up to a multiplicative error of one plus epsilon. And to argue that the additive error I see is the standard deviation, it's this additive plus or minus root k, I argue that via Chebyshev's inequality. Chebyshev's inequality only depends on variance. And variance only depends on the second moment, right? I mean, that's what variance is. It's a second moment. So I just need to have two y's independence in my hash function. As long as my hash function is from a two y's independent family, my variance will be as if it were from a truly random hash function H. And that's where I'm able to get away with the pseudo randomness in my hash function because I only need a variance bound. Okay. Um, so I know I didn't get, I know I didn't give you the, you know, write down all the details of the calculations, but that's basically the gist of it. What's the space here? Um, I need to store H. That's one thing that's log n bits. Okay. So H is log n bits to store. I need to store log n copies of the simple data structure. Each simple data structure takes k log n bits. So that's k log squared n. And k is 1 over epsilon squared. So in total, in total, what I've used, oh, I've used the maximum of the whiteboards. Let's claim a new whiteboard. Yeah, let's claim another whiteboard. And I know I'm almost out of time. So in total, I've used um, k times log squared n, which is one over epsilon squared log squared n bits. If I wanted failure probability delta, this would give me some constant failure probability. I could just repeat this data structure in parallel log one over delta times, and then output the median. That would give me one over epsilon squared log squared n log one over delta bits. The truth is that the, the complexity of this problem, upper and lower bounds, is one over epsilon squared log one over delta plus log n bits. And the upper bound is due to Yaroslav Boshik. And this is the upper bound. And the lower bound is due to um, David Woodruff in 04 
as well as Alon Matias and Segedi. So Alon Matias and Segedi showed that log n is a lower bound. David Woodruff showed that. Um, oh, he showed that one of Robson squared is lower bound. If you also want the log one over delta, I believe that you all, you need to use something from J Ram Woodruff. I forget the year. And this is the, this is for the lower bound. Okay, um, good. So I'm, I'm not going to have time. I'm not going to show you this uh, this particular upper bound, um, but it does use the similar idea of you know this geom you know geometrically decreasing levels, um, and you know somehow getting an you know zooming in at the right level to get a good to refine the, your your estimate of your of your uh, to refine your approximation to one plus epsilon. Um, so good. I, I, that took that. So just the upper bound took a full hour. On Monday, what I'll do is I'll show you how to prove lower bounds, and then we're going to move on to you know a larger class of problems that we're going to study Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Okay, so I think that's it for my hour. Any any um, any questions? Yeah, there is a question that uh, do not answer yet. So what's the prior distribution of the set of function capital H? I, I'm not sure what this means. Oh. Um, so also, so, so, so here I gave this example of a k-wise independent family, right? Which was like polynomial hashing. So um, in the actual algorithm that you know that I showed you, this is the actual algorithm. I said pick an H from a two-wise family. So for example, what you could do is assume n is a power of two, right? So now it is a prime power. And what you could do, for example, is um, just do ax plus b over that finite field. So your hash function is you pick a random A, you pick a random B from this finite field, which is a field of size two to the log n, of size n. And you just do, you know, your polynomial is a linear polynomial. It's AX plus B. Does that make sense? No? <laughs> okay. Well, is there still a question? There is another question. Okay. What's no upper lower bounds for the distinct elements problem in turnstile streams? Oh, in turnstile streams. Yeah. So that's a good question. So first of all, maybe you can explain what is turnstile yeah, yeah. to so the I audience. Said, I said this in the beginning that in turnstile, in turnstile, like you have this vector x, which is this high dimensional vector, and you see these coordinate wise updates, like add five to x one, subtract two from x three, and then now eventually I want to query. So in the, in the version that I'm showing you now of the distinct elements problem, I'm only allowed to see items. I'm not allowed to like unsee. I'm not allowed to delete items, right? So for example, if I said add one to x1, add one to x5, that's basically saying I saw one in the stream. I saw five in the stream. But then if I say subtract one from x1, that's like someone then later saying, you know what, subtract, you know, delete one from the stream. So not only do I want to support insertion of items in the stream, I also want to support deletion of items from the stream later. Does that make sense? So for example, yeah. you know, let's let's let me give you an example. Um, you know, let's say that <coughs> we're all we're on some social media site like Facebook, okay, and um, People are friending each other, and they're oh, actually that's not that's not a very good example. It's not a good example. Um, hmm. Okay, but you know, basically, someone can say, insert something. Insert, you know, insert one, insert two, insert one, delete one. So the stream has a bunch of insertions and deletions, right? And now I want to know. What's the support size of X or how many distinct elements are still in the set? So this would be like a more general problem where I'm allowed to, I'm also allowed to delete items, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the, you know, the problem with the algorithm that I just showed you, the non-idealized algorithm I just showed you is this simple, you know, this algorithm that I called simple at the top, it just stores the first k items you saw, the first k distinct items you saw. And once you see more than k items, it just gives up, right? But what if I insert 100 k items and then I delete 99 k items? 
You know what I mean? Then I actually have less than k items, right? So the simple al the simple algorithm won't work because once once I saw more than k, it gave up. It it, it didn't take into account that there could be later deletions of items. Um, now, but in any case, there is, there is there is an algorithm that solves the version even with deletions. In fact, there's a way to implement the simple data structure. And in fact, we're going to talk about that later when I talk about um, representing graphs as high dimensional vectors and sketching graphs. There's basically a way to solve exactly the same problem as the simple problem, what the simple problem is solving, even when there are deletions. So as long as at query time, there are less than k distinct elements, let's say I want to, I want to be able to answer the question. Right? Even, even if in intermediate steps, I have more than k items, as long as at query time I have under k, I want to be able to answer it. That turns out to be a solvable problem okay, with some, with some low memory data structure. Um, in fact, it'll use something like k log squared n bits instead of k log n bits. So there's an extra log n that enters the space complexity to be able to support these deletions. And in fact, that's optimal. But in terms of um, if you want to support deletions with deletions, um, so if you look at this paper by uh, Daniel Kane, myself, and David Woodruff, this was in 2010, we could show that it's, um, you could get a bound that's like one over epsilon squared times log n. I believe it's something like times maybe log log n plus log one over epsilon, if I remember correctly. And um, there, and there is a, there's a lower bound that either matches this or comes very close to matching this. I know that, I know that we also had a lower bound in the same paper. We had a lower bound of, of sorry. We had a lower bound of this in our paper, but there was a later paper by David Woodruff and another co-author who I'm forgetting right now that I think, that I think showed that even, even this part needs to be there. Um, any other questions? Yeah, so if it, there are more questions, then I, you can either just type into the, uh, the Q&A or, or you, you can simply unmute yourself and ask it. Uh, Jelani? Yeah. So how do you zoom in? I mean, how do you choose the, the like highest uh, bucket? Like, is it the first one that reports that uh, there's something there or does there have to be like a lot of items there before you believe it? So like, for example, this one? Yeah. So I said, I said, I said for, you know, so this, this red area that I circled right here, this part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you just go, if, even if you just use the first, like the deepest, the deepest uh, simple data structure that has something non-zero, you can prove that 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 already will be some constant factor approximation with you know decent probability. You don't need to wait until you have a few items. Even just having one is enough. Okay. I mean, it, it'll be a pretty bad constant in terms of like what is your constant factor of approximation, but it'll be it's a constant, and just having some constant is is good enough to be able to then you know zoom in here later. Cool. Any other questions? I, I have like a naive question. Is it important that you know n, the cap on the number of distinct elements? So here, yeah, so n here is like the universe that they're coming from. So like- Yeah, um, so is it is it important to know that in advance? Um, yeah, so you're saying, what if I don't know the, I don't know. Have any information about the universe they're coming from? That's your question, right? Yeah, I guess. I mean, in the online setting. Um, so I guess maybe to say your question, just say your question back. So, for example, each item I see in the in the stream is a string. And these strings could be of like unbounded length. So I don't have any a priori knowledge of, of like a bound on the size of the universe, right? Um, and I also, let's say, don't have a, any kind of bound on the stream length. Then I'm not so, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the answer to that would be.
Okay, any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Janani for a nice talk and we will continue uh, next Monday. Uh, we are done for this for this week, right, Nike? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Johnny. <laughs>